Uh, first on the agenda, we have uh, Senate File 3841, Senator May Aaron May Quaid. Welcome, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, if I could move my amendment, I believe it's the A1. Awesome. Senator Aaron May Quaid moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Before you is uh, Senate File 3841, which looks to delay the implementation of adult family foster care rate tiers and create a task force to study these proposed tiers and the impact that payment changes will have on the individuals currently living in the service. Last session, we passed legislation that removed adult family foster care service from the disability waiver rate system and established flat rate tiers effective January 1st, 2026. Uh, if you are just hearing about this right now, it's because we did not hear this bill in our committee. It was a provision from the House that we put into our um, conference committee report. So when I heard about it, I was said, this is not ringing any bells and that's why. Um, as providers are reviewing these potential new rates, there's growing concern over the potential rate reductions that they'll see and what that means for the future of these services. And so this bill will delay the implementation to 2028 to allow more time for a task force of providers, individuals receiving service, and the department representatives to look at the rates and make any necessary recommendations on the payment model and structure going forward. The author's amendment that we just adopted adjusts the makeup of the proposed task force by amending the required provider representation and including individuals receiving service on the task force, and it adjusts the timelines uh, for the task force's appointment and first meeting deadlines. Um, it was passed unanimously in the House yesterday. So with that, Mr. Chair, I have two testifiers today, and we can turn to Johnny first. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. For the record, my name is Johnny Tavetz. I am the uh, policy and engagement manager for ARM. ARM is a statewide trade association of residential service providers providing services through the four disability waiver, uh, waivers and supporting people in a variety of different living environments. From a four-person community residential setting to an individual's own home and in family homes, supporting people through adult family foster care services. Adult family foster care is a service option in which someone can choose to live with the family providing their services. The family foster care provider is licensed under 245D and must follow the same licensing regulations as a corporate service provider. Life sharing is a similar service, however, the life sharing service provider uh, operates under a corporate provider's 245D license. During the 2023 legislative session, new flat rate tiers for adult family foster care and life sharing services were passed effective January 1st, 2026. This means that these services, which were previously funded through the disability waiver rate system using the same forms and rate framework that other waiver service recipients use to determine needs and costs of services, will now be moved to a flat rate with no option for rate, uh, rate exception. Our family foster care provider members with ARM have many concerns with these proposed rate tiers. First, there is uncertainty as to what an individual's new rate will be. The rate tiers that have been published were based on data from 2017. These will have to be revised before final rates are published. The revised rate tiers are based on MN Choice 2.0, which continues to be delayed, further delaying the release of the final family foster care rates. Because rates are not final, widespread notification of the changes have not been made uh, to family foster care providers across the state. With a proposed effective date of January of 2026 for the new rate tiers, it is troublesome to not have the data that those rates will be based upon and to know that many providers are not aware of the changes coming their way. ARM has reviewed the current proposed rate tiers using the 2017 data. Initial modeling of those rates shows drastic rate reductions for some family foster care providers, resulting in many providers considering shutting their doors and no longer providing this critical service. With over 1,200 family residential providers in our state, the loss of even a few represents a major loss to the network of providers who do this work. The bill in front of you would delay the effective date for the implementation of a new rate tiers, pushing it back to 2028. We are also proposing the creation of a task force to further study the impact of the proposed rates and develop recommendations on future reimbursement models with family foster care providers at the table. We believe family foster care services are an important service option choice that individuals with disabilities can make. 
allowing these rate tiers to go into place under the current timeline will, without a doubt, cause a major disruption in services. Um, at a time of crisis level workforce shortages, um, it's more important than ever that we make sure that these doors stay open. So Mr. Chair, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you so much for your testimony, Mr. Tevet. Uh, before we move on to the next testifier, are there any questions from committee members? Senator Utke. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next up, we have um, on Zoom, uh, Linda Fairchild. Hello, Senator Hoffman and committee members. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Linda Fairchild, and I've been a family foster care provider for persons with disabilities since 1988. I provide services to people with significant medical and behavioral needs. It's a job I love. But changes to the flat tier rate for family providers would threaten my ability to continue doing this job and providing these services. It is a job that requires me to work 24 seven. I care for four adults and have done this for 20 plus years for them. I have high medical needs and behavior needs of these people and they depend on me for all cares and mobility. This job I love and I'm good at it. But at the present time, my ability to continue to do this job is in jeopardy if the flat rate happens for family providers because I will not be able to pay my staff and my bills at the flat rate predicted. With the projected flat rate, the homes with low needs are gonna be reimbursed $154.32 per day, which would be $6.35 an hour. For a home like mine with high needs and exceptions, the rate would be $304.62 per day, which is $12.69 an hour. I cannot pay my bills or have supplemental staff unless I got a job outside of my home to do this and be able to live with this rate. Then who cares for my people with disabilities? The flat rate has no exceptions. It is a true flat rate. You must either accept it or not. If you do not accept it, then the people need to move. Where will those I love go? The current flat rate does not, would not work. So families, I'm sorry. The current DWRS framework system does work for us. It pays staff a wage for all hours worked regardless of whether it's a family or a corporate home. That is how it should be. Family homes should be paid for the hours that they work just as a corporate home is. We all do the same type of work. There needs to be a better method for the state to understand how a family home runs and for them to know how these changes would impact our homes. Please put the rate back to the framework rate so that family homes can continue to exist or push it back so that a better and fair payment option can be looked at if not the current DWRS frameworks. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you so much for your testimony, uh, Ms. Fairchild. Next up, we have uh, Sandra Donahue from Donahue Foster Services. Welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Sandra Donahue. I am not. I am not only just representing my Donahue Foster Services. Since I've, since I've been in it since 2004, but I'm also representing the Minnesota Association of Residential Service Homes that we just created to help um, providers like myself um, keep able to do what we're, we do. I appreciate the delay to two, 2028 for the flat rate system and the proposal to create the task force, but we do not support the flat rate at all. In 2020, DHS wrote a legislative report on family providers and the DWRS rate system. In it, they said FRS homes are unique, and I agree with that. We provide the same services as corporate settings, however, we also provide an extended family to those we support and to their families. We do become their family. We are unique, but we shouldn't be penalized because we provide those services in our home. The report addresses costs that make us different. I challenge that. Like corporate settings, we have the same rules. We have the same mental and physical health challenges in the people that we support. We have the same need of hiring supplemental staff for one-to-one -one programming and awake staff written into their individual support plan. 
We are different in that we alone provide most of the daily cares of the people we support. We alone do all of the administrative paperwork for compliancy. We alone, we have to hire supplemental staff and it's not supported in the current rate system, let alone the flat rate system without exceptions that has been delayed till 2028. In my written testimony, I said 70% 70, 70 of us will close because we will not be able to meet the needs of the people we support. Are you, are you prepared for the displacement of up to 4,000 of the most vulnerable population, knowing of the staff, staff shortages that are addressed on the DHS Partners and Provider website? Are you um, prepared for the trauma it will inflict to those who are being ripped from the only family that they have? Are you prepared for the additional costs of people being placed back into hospitals and institutional settings as there's no other alternative for placement? Marsh, um, the representative, the board that I represent, is asking for a seat on the advisory task force as our members are made up of the same providers that are vulnerable to closure if the new rates are imposed. It is imperative that our voices are heard because the people we support have too much to lose without it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Donahue. Uh, lastly, we have uh, Gebby Tufa, uh, Board Secretary from the Alliance of Family Residential Service Providers. Welcome, Mr. Tufa. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, the committee members, uh, for this opportunity. My name is Gebby Tufa uh, from the city of Blaine, and I'm here in support of SF0841. Uh, I'm a board member of Alliance of Residential Service Providers, uh, an association that has close to 40 members and is still growing. Uh, ARCP was established in December 2023 with a primary purpose of increasing education uh, advocacy for its members, encouraging affiliation and, uh, and cooperation with other associations of similar purpose and interest, addressing the problems and concerns in providing residential service while offering mutual support among members. Uh, as a provider of family residential service for more than 10 years, uh, I, I believe uh, uh, that the flat rate negatively impact the service that uh, I provide the people under my care and therefore it is important to me and all members of our association that this bill passes. And my wife and I currently have a three residents uh, who we consider part of our families. One of these residents is a veteran with a traumatic brain injury and legally blind, requiring a high level of care. He came to our home with long list of behaviors that, uh, that could um, <laughs> scare family providers like ours, but he quickly adjusted uh, to this new home environment because of the great service we provide to him. We treated uh, all of our residents uh, as part of our family and provide them with person-centered service uh, that they deserve. One of our other residents came from nursing home uh, due to self-neglect at his apartment. Uh, our service helped him to gradually recover and integrate into the community. Our third client also came from the group home with a long list of behaviors, mental health issues. Uh, and his behavior significantly improved within a short period of time, and his parents are very happy with the service we, and, uh, we provide and the improvement he made. In order for us to continue providing the quality service these residents uh, need, my wife and I have to work long hours, like 24 hours supervisions. We also have to hire supplemental workers who, to meet the service needs of these residents, and keep the quality of service that they, uh, we, we provide them. Providing this kind of quality service comes with opportunity cost to our, our family, but we are very happy with the service we provide. Changing the current rate system to flat rate will significantly uh, impact our ability to continue providing the quality service. If we are unable to continue providing the level of service to our clients, they don't have any other option but to go back to the group home or nursing home that they originally came from. This will eventually lead to the same old problem they were facing before moving to our family environment. In conclusion, I have no doubt that you, uh, the committee, truly believe that the, uh, the vulnerable adults with disability have, uh, have the right to choose where they want to live and who they want to live with and they chose to live with us. 
Neither do I have the doubt that you support programs like family residential homes that change the lives of many uh, disabled people for better, uh, to better improve their overall health and improvement. I have no concern that if uh, family providers are not fairly compensated to, uh, for the hard work they do, they would be forced to close their door to the people they love to serve, which I personally believe will be more expensive to the state of Minnesota. Members of our association serve diverse clients with diverse needs where the proposed flat rate will not work and more time is needed to conduct an appropriate study that include family, residential service providers and all stakeholders for the impact. Our association would like to be part of this study and task force. We do not agree with the proposed flat rate and would like to ask you to support SF-3841 to delay the implementation of the flat rate or the rate change until January 1, 2028. The Alliance of Residential Service Providers want their voice heard and your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for your service and for the work you do as legislator. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank ARM uh, as they are really advocating for that. I myself are part of uh, uh, this organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tufa, for sharing your experiences, your story, and your testimony. Um, members, are there any questions? Senator Utke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I understand what the bill is, is doing or it's supposed to do, but a couple questions on the background of this. And uh, I think, Senator McQuaid, you had mentioned when you started um, this bill came back from conference committee. It was not a bill or anything we heard last year. It just was inserted. So apparently it's coming from the House. What is the background on where this came from? Do you know? And, you know, agency bill, one group or the other, or what can you help me with on the history? Uh, Senator, okay, I think this bill was heard in the governor's budget uh, in the committee last year, but I'll also let Senator McQuaid respond. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Aki. And uh, full disclosure, it was a meeting that I had in my district where I was asking for help because I didn't remember this topic coming up. And I was told that it was, uh, I think, talked about in more depth in the House and maybe not as much here. But I would defer to any nonpartisan staff, our vice chair here, um, to talk a little bit more if we did have a long conversation and I just didn't remember it. When we talked about this issue in my community, um, with a, a really large meeting, it just wasn't something that was resonating with me as something that stuck out uh, as something we talked about in depth. And maybe Mr. Chair, my testifier can provide some. Yeah, Mr. Tavet. Johnny Tavet, uh, program manager with ARM. Um, <laughs> this issue came up just from hearing from so many of our family foster care providers. Um, this uh, flat rates um, has been a discussion point since inception last year so I, I guess I'm not entirely sure what else to provide in terms of background but um, it's it's come from talking with them and um, having concerns over where this is going Senator Utke. Okay, thank you mr. chair and yeah you, you're addressing it after the fact <clears throat> I was wondering on the front end where it came from if and it kind of sounds like you're saying it came from the department bill and I mean we can talk about it here or we can take it offline, but I'd like to know what drove that in the first place and what they expected to gain because it sounds like it's a kind of a total disaster and to try and push that through without the proper vetting and hearings is irresponsible and uh, um, I don't know, we can, we can take it offline with the department too, but I would like more history on it, on why we ended up in this place. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Can we ask our staff if they know the answer to the question? If they don't, that's fine. Just the basic, like. Yeah. Or any department people here as well? Um, Christy Grom, Ms. Grom. <laughs> I, Mr. Chair, I think Kyle was going to. Kyle. Yes, Mr. Chair, members. So um, the. this was a governor's proposal um, that established a life sharing be services benefit and uh, implemented the family residential rate tiers. It was heard in the original bill in committee. However, it wasn't included in the Senate position. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Aki, I, I feel really similarly. I, I think it was uh, something that I felt like I was getting a lot of information about and the impact about after the fact and not 
during the discussions, and so that's why I think delaying is, is important, because I also feel like I need more information, that there needs to be more conversation before we move to this, yeah. Senator Rocky. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and that's fine. I mean, we've got this one now to move forward with a fix, but I just get frustrated with the fact that these things slip through and they continue to push things backwards and stuff. So, yeah, we'll, we'll move forward here and we'll fill in the blanks later. Thanks, Senator Rocky. Are there any member questions or comments? Seeing none, any closing comments, Senator McQuaid? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the time here and for uh, folks at ARM and, and in community for bringing this to my attention so we can do something about it before things go haywire. Thank you so much. So uh, Senator McQuaid moves that this be recommended to pass and be referred to the state and local government and veterans committee. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The bill is passed and re referred. Thank you so much, Senator McQuaid. Next up, we have Senator Rasmussen. SF 4329. Senator, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have an author's amendment, so I'd like to move the A2 for consideration. Senator Rasmussen moves the A2 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a fairly simple bill here today. Um, for those who aren't familiar, the senior linkage line helps Minnesotans think through long-term care options. And as a part of uh, legislation that was previously passed is a required step uh, to be able to enter into an assisted living contract, uh, to enter into a lease. And as a part of this process uh, that's in place currently, a potential uh, lease signer has to get a verification code from the senior linkage line uh, to demonstrate that they have received uh, counseling around their options for long-term care. Uh, both the agency and a number of stakeholders have identified a few problems with that process that this bill seeks to address. One is that by the time someone is looking to sign a lease, enter into a contract, uh, it's relatively late in the process and not the right point to be engaging with this type of counseling for them to be thinking about options. Additionally, it has created an unnecessary burden on both providers and prospective residents for long-term care. Um, and it's resulted in, for the senior linkage line, uh, longer wait times than needed and also uh, frustrated prospective re uh, residents that are calling in that don't necessarily need some of the services that they provide. And so this bill would re remove the requirement for the verification code, but uh, require that um, assisted living providers must still inform prospective residents about the senior linkage line and the counseling services that they offer. Uh, this has a few benefits. One, from a state board of aging perspective, the senior linkage line will be able to uh, redirect resources to more proactive uh, outreach and ensuring that Minnesota seniors who need these services are able to get them. It also removes a burden on assisted living providers and the residents who are seeking those uh, services. Um, so a fairly straightforward bill um, that's trying to acknowledge feedback that both uh, the Board on Aging and um, others in this ecosystem have provided. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have uh, one testifier who's joining us on Zoom today. Thank you so much, Senator Rasmussen. Um, on Zoom, we have Ms. Schneider from the Minnesota Board on Aging. Welcome, Ms. Schneider. Please introduce yourself for the record and uh, proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. My name is Maureen Schneider. I'm the interim chair of the Minnesota Board on Aging. The Minnesota Board on Aging is a 25-member board. We are appointed by the governor. Um, the board has representation from each of the congressional districts in Minnesota. We serve four-year terms, and we are a working board. I appreciate being able to speak with you today about this uh, policy proposal regarding the senior linkage line verification code. And I thank Chair Rasmussen for that excellent background that he has provided. Um, when I think back to the 2000 legislation, when this was introduced, it did make sense at the time. But since then, it has become quite cumbersome and it works upstream against efforts to provide elders and their families with the early intervention they need before they 
are forced to make expensive, uh, possibly life-changing decisions that are made. Uh, it also has some other benefits, and one of them that is really important to me is the use of existing resources um, at this critical time when we're dealing with hospital discharge um, issues, housing issues, et cetera, et cetera. And so I want to uh, spend my time, because I don't feel I have to give you a lot of background um, after what um, Senator Rasmussen has already told us, I want to give you um, a personal story that has happened in my family that I believe will very clearly illustrate the need for this um, proposal. I have a family member who resides in Northwestern Minnesota. She is in her late 90s. She is very, uh, very much in charge of her own affairs. She resides in her own um, private home. Uh, she tends her garden, she grows flowers, she serves her community, has been named Volunteer of the Year and received multiple awards for her volunteer hours over the years. In November of 2023, this dear lady fell in her garage and she fractured her hip. She was taken by ambulance to a regional medical center where uh, she had surgery and several days following surgery, she was discharged to her local hospital uh, for, for some um, follow-up care. During that time, her family, which includes um, her two daughters, both of whom are RNs and excellent resources in every way to their mother, uh, were beginning to look at the possibility that she would not be able to return to her own single family home. Um, my, my relative was obviously upset about this, sad, concerned, wondering uh, what her next step might be uh, and looking for something that was logical and um, as practical as possible. Um, it was decided after um, some back and forth conversation, information from hospital discharge planners, social workers and others, that she would um, become a resident at the assisted living, which is part of the hospital. Uh, I was taking a very personal and hands-on interest in the matter because of my long career and interest in aging because of the mission of the Board on Aging to support Minnesota's elders and their families to live well and age well, and because I care very deeply for this person and I wanted the best solution for her, although I knew how much it was hurting her to have to leave her home. Um, I was calling quite frequently, and I knew that she was scheduled to move into an assisted living apartment. Um, and I, I was calling um, her that morning just to make sure that she was feeling calm and that she had her questions answered and to see if there was anything else that I could do and offer my support and assistance. And when I got her on the telephone, uh, it took a lot of time for her to answer. And then when she did, I said, um, are you still moving into your assisted living apartment today? And she said, well, I'm supposed to, but um, I'm not sure when. Um, my daughters are down in the office now um, at the assisted living office. And I said, and what are they doing? And she said, I'm not sure. I think they're looking to get some sort of a verification code. There was my aha moment. Um, these were people who were well-informed they understood what their options were, but they were waiting until move-in day, move-in hour, if you will, to get the verification code. And that to me uh, was crystal clear in terms of the need to make this adjustment to the policy. And so I thank you for listening to my story. And of course, I will take any questions if there are any, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, um, uh, Ms. Schneider. And uh, any questions for Ms. Schneider, or our author? Seeing none, um, Senator Rasmussen, what do you want to do with this? You want to go to judiciary with it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My preference would not be to go to the Judiciary Committee. I've uh, talked with fiscal staff and also talked with the Minnesota Board on Aging. There's no fiscal component to this bill. One of the things I like the most about it is that it uh, there basically allows them to use existing resources to actually do more for Minnesota seniors who need the type of counseling services that are provided through the senior linkage line. And so my preference, Mr. Chair, if you're amenable, is to send it to general orders today. Members? Senator Rasmussen, you want to make your motion, and we can all, uh, you're good. Yeah, I'm getting thumbs up up here. Right. Thank so. you, Mr. Chad. Move. Um, <laughs> you, I just heard somebody <laughs> say roll call. That, thank you, Mr. Chad. <laughs> move that uh, Senate file 4329 is amended be uh, recommended to, to pass and be re referred to general orders. All those in favor of Senator Rasmussen's um, movement say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen, and welcome to the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Senator Matthews, that's <laughs> I suppose there's some rule about that. If somebody calls it out, aren't you supposed to, you know, you're the legal person here. Aren't you supposed to, like, abide by that? <laughs> Next up uh, is uh, me. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. I, uh, thank you uh, for having patience with me today. And Senator Fate, you want to go do your thing? Welcome, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, there's an A1 amendment in front of you. It's an author's amendment. Senator Hoffman moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I want to thank Senator Mann, Senator Abler, and Senator Seberger for co-authoring this bill. This is the medical assistance eligibility timeline modifications for certain hospital patients, and that uh, looks at providing supplemental payments for certain disability waiver services and providing additional permissible circumstances for the appointment of an emergency guardian. And there's multiple conversations regarding this, and there's multiple stakeholders in this. And what, what we would want to hope is going to happen is that at the end of the day that all the stakeholders are are dressing toward the one goal, which is we really need to look at uh, the, the piece of emerg emergency guardianship. Um, our former committee administrator, Kevin Parker, who is now, and since he got poached by the governor and he's not telling us what kind of budgets there are, I just want to let people know in full disclosure. Um, he actually worked on some of this stuff in, in our committee last year. And, and so I just remember the heart-wrenching stories of individuals that you know, there was uh, some things that were of concern, and I think we need to all be on the same boat to say what's the one thing we really care about is to make sure that people are given what their unique needs are. So um, the author's amendment, I thank you for doing that. That just that modifies the SMERT process by allowing hospitals under limited circumstances to directly refer a patient for a SMERT disability determination. Uh, it requires a commissioner to actively intervene in a case when the county fails to complete an expedited MA eligibility determination within the required timelines. And then uh, it modifies uh, certified min choices assessors uh, qualifications by eliminating the requirement that the assessor have two years of experience working in HCBS. Uh, requires a commissioner to actively intervene in a case when the lead agency fails to complete an expedited min choices assessment. Um, and then it allows the complete min choices assessment to be valid for up to one year. Um, and it, and it, in this case, we'd also, the amendment that you just brought in, it deletes the emergency guardianship language. There's some, we got some work to do and we got multiple senators and multiple advocates that are helping us define what that's gonna look like. And I believe a lot of them are here today and we need to really be listening and making sure we're all uh, going toward what we need to do. Members, as we all know, decompression, uh, uh, which you heard in the first bill, 
uh, really, you know, getting patients out of the hospital when they're ready to discharge has become a major issue for hospitals, especially when it comes to complex patients, right? And, and, and I don't complex patients, but the complex needs that some patients might have. Um, they contribute to what is known as a financial strain for many of the hospitals. You get the reports, members, not only about who should be being discharged, but also about the fact that there are um, thousands of days that, that, um, that, are, that are not paid because of the fact that people are boarding. More importantly, the challenges in the transitioning patients to the right level of care um, when they no longer need acute care treatment really disproportionately impacts the most vulnerable and the complex um, needs that certain patients have, and that they are eligible for various health care and human services programs we oversee. Uh, last year, the Hospital Association estimated that there are more than 195,000 avoidable days, and I'm going to look at Senator Atke because he knows that number pretty well, um, and that avoidable days in hospitals across the state, these are days when the patient no longer meets the medical criteria for hospitalization, but they're stuck in the hospital for various reasons. And the last count I had, there was 2,000 beds um, system-wide, uh, Mr. Chair. But the main four components of this bill that's brought for this committee to, to take a look at uh, aims to streamline the prioritization for those that are really stuck um, in the hospitals, right? Number one is the min choices assessment, the medical eligibility determinations, the rate setting process with community um, providers, and of course, we are going to have to have the conversation of guardianship uh, somewhere along the line um, when this year. The amendment that you just adopted really reflects the ongoing work that the various stakeholders on this bill, uh, including the counties, the Department of Human Services, the hospitals, advocacy groups, among others, right? People are, are doing what, what I'd ask, that, that they go and, and figure out what's the best path to go forward, and there's multiple. The amendment reflects simplifications in the min choices process and maximizes, now you want to have a conversation about min choices, we can do that, Mr. Chair, but I think it, we all know that, that we need to really maximize the existing resources and establishes an escalation, the, the escalation process that DHS for both min choices assessments and the Medicaid applications for patients who are in the hospital ready to discharge and have been waiting for more than five days uh, for progress on those processes. And then that establishes a supplemental rate for the community providers so that patients can be discharged to the appropriate facility while the provider and the counties uh, determine the long-term care, the long-term rate for that patient. Um, one additional process that we all need to still and we are working on, um, but, but we'll be working through different vehicles. It, it mentioned about the guardianship piece. There's lots of folks talking about that. Uh, when a patient needs a guardian appointed uh, by the courts, uh, it takes months to get the court date set, um, which has to happen before the care teams can identify their eligibility for Medicaid and, and or take the next steps in their care journey. Um, I expected others to make sure that the conversations are ongoing and that we all continue to work on getting the language right so that this meaningful, it makes a meaningful impact for the complex um, needs of patients who are getting stuck in these processes. You know, I have some testifiers here. There's Dr. Ryan Grenier uh, and then Heather Kelly. And I don't know, I, I think there's a few others that might want to talk about this because it is an ongoing discussion. So with that, Mr. Chair, um, we can bring up our Thank doctors. you so much, Senator doctors. Hoffman. Um, doctors, how many doctors do we have in the house today? <laughs> Dr. Grenier, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Please introduce yourself for the record. And I never have enough doctors. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair Hoffman. Um, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important legislation. My name is Ryan Greiner. I've been a physician at North Memorial for nearly 10 years. Uh, while I continue to practice as an internist and hospitalist at our Robbinsdale campus, treating patients admitted with acute medical conditions, I also oversee the work of our utilization and case management teams. Basically, this means I actively participate in solving for the increasingly complex discharge barriers for patients who need direct engagement with the state and county agencies, along with the court system, in order to discharge them to appropriate and safe environments. These are unique and complex challenges that go beyond the issues of capacity and our post-acute skilled care facilities and add to the uncompensated care that we provide. 
More importantly, these issues propagate a disservice to a vulnerable population that requires our compassion, commitment, and dedication to addressing their needs. A hospital is not a home, nor is it an enriching environment for vulnerable individuals to thrive and succeed. The Robbinsdale campus is a level one trauma center that serves complex and diverse populations across the state. We are also a critical fixture in an underserved community with limited health care and financial resources. Without the Robbinsdale Hospital, the surrounding community would have few options to maintain their health and improve their quality of life. We truly are a safety net health system for the most vulnerable citizens of our county and state. As you are likely aware, hospital stays are paid based on the acute conditions and their treatments. It's a fixed payment based on a predicted length of stay for their medical condition. When a patient stays longer than expected for custodial reasons, the hospital is no longer reimbursed for services. However, we still continue to provide those services, costing thousands of dollars a day, doing our best to prevent hospital-based complications and keeping the patients safe. And it's not easy. Hospitals are not designed to care for patients who don't need active medical care. Imagine the impact on an elderly patient with dementia who would benefit from social interaction, time outside, and specialized therapies, to name a few. They aren't getting those in a hospital. Equally as important, these patients occupy beds and take up resources that are then not available to patients who need acute care. This has had a significant impact on overwhelming the emergency departments, resulting in a high percentage of patients who leave without being seen. It limits the transfers we can take from outside hospitals, as well as the ability for patients to get much needed surgical procedures. Ultimately, it significantly disrupts patient flow through our healthcare <coughs> ecosystem, creates financial strain, and jeopardizes the ability to deliver on our mission to serve the vulnerable communities that depend on us. Under current state, it's not unusual to have a patient pending guardianship, group home placement, or applications for medical assistance to be housed in an acute care hospital for 150 or more days. The average length of stay for a hospitalized patient is four days. That means that that one bed occupied by that patient, inappropriately, could have been used to care for additional 40 patients. Now multiply that by 10 patients on average at any given time under boarding circumstances pending these difficult uh, dispositions and you can understand the scope and impact of these delays. And when Chair Hoffman mentioned 195,000 avoidable days, I did the quick math, it's 48,000 patients that could have been seen in those beds if we would have not had these types of delays. There's your bed capacity issue in the state of Minnesota. It's not going to get easier without your help. As others have noted, delays are for many reasons, like the lack of bed capacity or staff in many post-acute care settings, but in the instances of extremely prolonged delays, these are most typically due to state and county processes. I want to leave you with two main points today before I turn it over to a colleague from M Health Fairview to give a few patient examples. First, hospitals are designed to safely treat acute care needs. They are not designed for long-term stays for custodial care. Long-term custodial stays are not optimized for nor conducive to the long-term health for these vulnerable patients. And when patients are forced to remain in the hospital, there are significant impacts on patient care as well as catastrophic financial implications for providers and health systems. Second, we have been working extremely hard on this problem within our hospitals. We have made significant changes. We've been creative with a number of patients. We've realigned resources and invested to focus on complex cases. But we are to a point where we need systemic interventions like those addressed in this bill. We need the state and county to become part of the solution and not the ongoing barrier to fixing the foundational issues in the care of these patients. In the end, we all want the patient's health and well-being as the number one priority, and I urge you to support the continued work to develop the solutions that will make a difference for the citizens of Minnesota. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Doctor. Um, next up, uh, Heather Kelly. Welcome to our committee. Please identify yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Perfect. Mr. Chair and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate File 3989. My name is Heather Kelly. I am a licensed clinical social worker and a member of the care management team for Fairview Health Services, primarily working on inpatient care management services for the University of Minnesota Medical Center. 
The inpatient care management team consists of nurse care coordinators, social workers, and community health workers that assist with coordinating discharge plans for patients when they are ready to leave the hospital. This includes arranging transitional care units, long-term care facilities, group homes, and home care, to name a few. We are grateful to Senator Hoffman and others for bringing this bill forward as this bill will have a vast impact on the patients and family members that our healthcare system serves. One of the most significant challenges we currently face as a health system is helping our patients find and secure appropriate settings to discharge to into the community once they no longer need an acute care hospital stay. Patients who we are unable to secure discharge plans for that can meet their needs end up staying in our hospitals for weeks and months past when they are medically ready to discharge. Through the first 10 months of last year, Fairview had over 20,000 avoidable patient bed days for patients who are quote unquote stuck in our hospitals due to discharge barriers and delays. This challenge is not unique to our hospitals nor to Minnesota, but unfortunately is impacting hospitals across the country. These avoidable days cause our hospital beds to be at or over capacity on a daily basis and thus we do not have beds available for all of the patients that present to our emergency department. This creates a backlog of patients boarding in our emergency department waiting on an inpatient bed to open up. This causes an immense amount of frustration for the patients that we serve and their family members. On any given day, we average about 60 to 80 patients who have no medical need to be hospitalized, but who remain in our hospitals related to discharge barriers. This bill takes some important steps to help reduce um, the delays experienced by our medically ready to discharge patients that are created by lengthy state and hospital eligibility processes. Based on our experience, on average, a min choice assessment currently takes four to 12 weeks to get scheduled. Medical assistance eligibility approvals are taking four to eight weeks or sometimes longer, and guardianship and conservatorship petitions can take four to 12 weeks just to get a court date. I want to highlight one example that helps illustrate the compounding challenges each of these lengthy processes can present to patients and our care management teams. We recently had an individual who was at one of our hospitals for 189 days. Due to medical complexities and lack of skilled nursing facility beds, this patient was globally denied from all transitional care units. He received therapies and rehabilitated here at the hospital and eventually no longer met TCU level of care. He did not have a payer source for long-term care nor a group home and facilities all recommended guardianship before they would consider him for placement. Family petition for emergency guardianship and conservatorship. It took five weeks to get a court date. Once guardianship and conservatorship were in place, family was able to obtain the needed proofs to complete and submit a medical assistance application. It took almost eight weeks for the MA application to be approved. A referral was made for a min choice assessment, which was then scheduled six weeks out. Once the MA application was approved and the assessment was completed, the patient had to be smirted, the waiver had to be opened, the care management team had to find an accepting group home, and the group home and the county had to agree upon a rate. The patient only had a medical need to be hospitalized for 17 days, but remained in the hospital an additional 172 days while the care management team worked through the aforementioned barriers. Unfortunately, this is just one of many similar examples that are far too commonplace for many patients and families across our state. We acknowledge that there is ongoing work with the Department of Human Services Acute Care Transitions Advisory Council on this topic, but for the sake of our patients and care team members, we cannot wait until 2025 to begin addressing some of these processes creating discharge barriers. Thank you, Senator Hoffman, for your leadership on this issue. We look forward to continuing to work with you and others on these challenging situations for our patients and their families. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Um, next up, we've got uh, via Zoom, uh, Jill Pooler. Jill, welcome to our committee. Uh, there I see, there you come up. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I appreciate this time to testify. 
My name is Jill Fuller, and I'm the Aging and Disability Services Manager at Wright County Health and Human Services. And I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Association of Social Service Administrators, also known as MAXA. From a high level, I wanna say counties do agree with the expressed concerns of people not being able to discharge from hospital settings in a timely manner. This is of course not healthy or good for anyone. However, we do have some concerns about, this, about several provisions within the bill and believe there may be a more practical way to approach effective solutions together. I can attest that counties lead agencies would already be meeting the timelines laid out in, in this legislation if we had the capacity. Unfortunately, our current system, the lack of placement options and staffing shortages have made that unattainable and frankly, frankly unrealistic. Putting more emphasis on people in the hospital setting will also force counties to shift and pull resources away from other individuals who actually may have more intensive medical, psychiatric, or safety needs than the person who's waiting in the hospital to be discharged. Putting priority language in legislation is a slippery slope considering the many different types of residents we serve. Most drastically, this would create an ethical dilemma within county decision-making regarding who are able to serve first and when. Regarding, or while we understand the intention of creating initial financial incentives for providers through the supplemental payment concept, this could really cause unnecessary strife between the county and providers when rates will later need to be reduced to comply with ongoing state standards. I see the guardianship portion of this bill was removed through the recent amendment, um, but we do wanna just get uh, our, our concerns on record. Our, the guardianship aspect of the bill does seem to be more focused on hospitals desire to have people transitioning to another setting versus the person's actual identified need for a true guardian. Appointing someone's uh, guardianship over another individual is not something that should be taken lightly uh, as this really directly relates to the person's right to self-determination and their personal autonomy. MAXA has appreciated initial discussions with hospitals and would respectfully like to move forward with an alternative approach. A previous testifier mentioned county processes as being part of the delay, and please be reassured that we all are in the same, uh, have the same goal to serve all our community residents as timely and appropriately as possible. So with that in mind, counties are actually working on draft language at, uh, at this time that would focus on reducing the complexity of the min choices assessment itself, thus decreasing the amount of time per assessment and increasing the number of people we would be able to serve. MAXA is waiting for final bill language and is hoping to introduce it soon. We have already been in conversations with the Hospital Association, disability advocates from the ARC Minnesota and the Department of Human Services regarding our language and have received positive feedback. Our proposed language would accomplish three things. Um, we would first, it would allow initial assessments to remain valid for 365 days, which avoids staff and clients needing to complete re sorry, to complete repeat work through the eligibility update process. And I was very pleased to see, I believe that was added as part of the recent amendment to this bill. Uh, secondly, our language would change the initial visit time for county staff to be completed uh, within, instead of 20 calendar days, it would move it to 20 business days. And finally, and most importantly, it would reduce unnecessary annual reassessments for case scenarios where the person's needs and service requests have not changed. These annual reassessments can take staff eight to 10 hours to complete and include an in-depth conversation with clients where the client must discuss sometimes emotional and often even tra traumatic type of information, which is not actually needed at that time. In these instances, the client and, and their guardian would remain in charge and would be able to choose to utilize an abbreviated assessment process or could still request the full annual reassessment if that were their desire. So we are looking forward to continuing discussions with legislators and hospitals to collaborate on ways to solve systematic complexities so that we can serve all of those who need our services. Thank you again for your time and attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Pooler. Uh, members, any questions for Senator Hoffman or our testifiers? Somebody must have said treats out back because <laughs> they vacated you. We lost somebody. I do have um, a question because part of it was I wanted to know the path of this. Um, next step is HHS. Yep. But uh, a comment as you listen to this, we've got challenges all around and part of it maybe is what, what are you thinking for a final landing on this? But you know we hear about the challenges at the hospitals 
Um, they're housing these patients a lot longer and um, being held liable for hundreds of millions of dollars in costs over the last year. Um, the counties just testified that, you know, the, some of that bill's going to land on them. Um, do we know how we're going to mediate those or walk this fine line so that we can this kind of, we don't create winners and losers? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and to that point, that's why at the very beginning when all these conversations were happening, I, I had asked everybody to, you know, get together, right? I know like in the guardianship conversation, you got Susie Scheller, Sean Burke, you got folks that are really, you know, front and center on all these as well. And the Bet Zerwas, you know, it, it, having, we got to have that conversation. And it isn't an interesting, Mr. Chair, that one of the things pointed out was about the 20 business day, the reassessments, the things that we had been talking about all along about min choices. So it's not just like one little rabbit hole that we're going down on, you know, but there's multiple system stuff, I think, at the same time. Ultimately, um, you know, we're going to have to have all of that together here um, and, and look at it when we start marking up our bill, I think, at the end of the day, because there's just too much complexity in everything that's out there, and there's so many people that, that we need to make sure that are at the table having the discussions because of their expertise, Mr. Chair. But ultimately, I used that word twice in one sentence, the, the, the person that we really need to focus on is the patient, right? I mean, we really, and that's where in our conversations of the assessments, reassessments, min choices, wherever, waiver, reimagine, whatever you're doing, we always say in this committee, well, what's the benefit for the patient or what's the benefit to the client or what's the benefit to the one receiving services? So um, it's our ongoing conversation, Mr. Chair, and all that doesn't answer. I'd like us all to have all this into one night, nice little package that says, yeah, we, we finally fixed some of the concerns this, this year, especially, Mr. Chair, you know, we hear the conversation of decompression, decompression, decompression. We had a task force, I say a task force, but there's a working group looking at that, but we're hearing these stories over and over and over again, but it's not just anecdotal stories, but it's really a systemic piece. So I think that added the systemic side, it needs to come through us. Yep. Oh, thank you, uh, Senator Hoffman, because yes, we heard all the different levels of challenges through our testifiers here this afternoon from the time it takes for this application and that application and the delay and then the cost shifts and all these things. So um, Senator Hoffman named a lot of names when he was, uh, or named some names as he's talking about this. Everybody get a hold of Senator Hoffman and uh, work on this so that in the end we've got something that's workable and beneficial across the board um, because we do have a big problem, and hopefully we can move the needle some to uh, help things uh, all the way around. So um, with that, uh, I don't see any further questions or comments. Uh, Senator Hoffman, would you like to uh, move your bill as amended then to do pass here and uh, be sent to HHS? So be it, Mr. Chair, as you said. Thank you. Thank you, members. Understand the uh, motion there. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. These are continued conversations that we have here. Doctors, thank you very much. Ms. Pooler, nice to see you all the way from Buffalo, Minnesota on Zoom. Um, Mr. Chair, I think the next one is... Mr. Or Senator Hoffman, yes, uh, next bill up is Senate File 4044. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair and members. This is the Assisted Living Licensure Settings Expansion. Um, talk about uh, another issue that we need to deal with and, and having multiple stakeholders with their various expertise being part of this conversation. This is just one, one little process toward that. And I mentioned the names earlier. Um, and, I, and, and those names are also involved in this conversation as well. And I would hope that we continue to work collaboratively to get to the right result on that. There's an A2 amendment, author's amendment, Mr. Chair. And um, I can just have that. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Okay, I just got a copy. I, was, I had heard there was one, um, and I was looking for it. So um, would, would you like to just give us a... Yeah. It's a, 
I doesn't would. have a lot. Give us a quick uh, once over, to, and then we'll vote on the amendment. I'm going to go line by line, actually. Thank um, you. Um, <laughs> Uh, two things, Mr. Chair. It removes the language that would require the HUD finance settings to be licensed. It was a sticking point, but there's something about, I guess, the feds have more jurisdiction than the state or something like that. Uh, the second thing is it adds language that really specifies that any setting that holds itself out as assisted living, even those otherwise exempt from licensure are assisted living facilities and thus must be licensed. And remember, Mr. Chair, our conversation last year about housing with services, now we got 144, what, A or G or 144A. I mean, all these conversations are right in the realm of this, so this just does it. So those that's what the amendment uh, really does. It just clarifies those two things. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Members, we have before us the A2 amendment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. The amend amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Hoffman, to your bill, as amended. In 2019, Mr. Chair and members, the legislature uh, passed this historic assisted living licensure law. Lots of people involved with that conversation. Making Minnesota the, the last state in the country to license assisted living settings. Uh, the law gave residents critical consumer protections to ensure their rights and safety are upheld. When passed, however, there were two types of settings that were exempted from licensure, even though they provided the same or similar services. And two of those types of exempt settings were those receiving money from HUD for housing and those receiving low-income housing tax credits. Now, the concern at the time was that the federal funding may be jeopardized if forced to be licensed, right? Since that time, however, DHS has hosted two working groups to study the issue and issued multiple reports. The report in June of 2022 lays out, Mr. Chair and members, the ways in which residents in these exempt settings receive less protection than those in assisted living. Notably, those working groups and reports have found no legal reason why residents in these settings should not receive the same or similar consumer protections as their peers in assisted living. Now, these gaps, Mr. Chair, in the system, they do have real consequences. And, and I'll never forget getting the phone call by a constituent. Susie Scheller called me and said there was this tax credited facility in Bemidji where residents were forced to leave a dangerous building but here's the thing, there were no obligations on the provider, none, to assist with finding a new safe place to live. And the resulting chaos left vulnerable adults, some were vent dependent, uh, without safe places to go and no clear path to enforce, appeal, or otherwise challenge what just happened to them. Imagine that, Mr. Chair. Uh, we always talk about transparency and accountability, and this is one of those that was like, well, wait a minute, why, right? And the bill fixes that current parity in the system by providing residents in HUD and the LIHTC, L-I-H-T-C settings, who receive services similar consumer protections. Notably, and there are three things, freedom from retaliation, freedom from arbitrary discharge, due process and appeal rights upon termination from the facility. And, and those are think three really, when you talk about the essence of this bill, not to quote a certain senator from Mankato 10 years ago, essence of this bill is really those three things, uh, Mr. Chair. And with that, um, there is like five people that want to testify on that. And if you just want to start calling them up, we, we can sure go ahead and, and do that, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, thank you, Senator Hoffman. Uh, yes, first up we have uh, Sasha Rabakinia. Rakbika. Please help me with that. I'm sorry that I butchered it. Welcome <laughs> to our okay. committee. And uh, now tell us how to pronounce your name and then you can proceed with your testimony. Uh, Sasha Rabakina. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I brought some photos here of my grandma too, just for a visual. This is her and her first great grandbaby, so my daughter here. Um, so my grandma Ludmila is a woman of warmth and kindness. She helped to raise my brother and I when we first immigrated to the United States. She showed me unconditional love, support, and has been one of the most influential people in my life. 
It is with a heavy heart, though, that the same woman who gave so selflessly was also the one mistreated and neglected in a facility that was meant to provide her with care, comfort, and security. In 2020, my grandma moved to a HUD-subsidized locked memory care facility in the Twin Cities Metro. Since last year, she has experienced a significant decline. She hardly recalls faces or can identify the people closest to her. She now requires full assistance with her daily cares, including repositioning, dressing, bathing, eating, and walking. My grandma has experienced numerous falls, unexplained injuries, bruising, and was even found lying in her own stool and urine for hours. In September of 2023, she was placed on one-to-one -one staffing needs for loss of inhibitions, which is a normal and expected part of the dementia progression. However, this facility did this without a physician order, no documented progress notes, no complaints from staff, and no justifiable reasoning for why continuous supervision was needed. Due to my grandma's need for continuous supervision, the facility sent a letter with a 10-day notice of termination of services. Due to the current state statute, my grandma had minimal rights or protection and was not able to appeal her termination of notice. As a registered nurse, I knew what was happening with my grandma was unethical and wrong. The facility did not provide us with resources when the termination notice was sent and did not provide support in finding a new safe facility. I spent countless hours with her healthcare team, collecting and sifting through thousands of pages of medical records and consulting with various health professionals just to prove that my grandma is not a harm to anyone. We were getting rejected from facility after facility because of the alleged need for continuous observation that my grandma did not need from the start. At this point, my family felt helpless. I felt that there was no clear path forward. And when I asked what would happen if we were unable to find a facility in time, they said that she can remain living there, but she would have no services. This would mean nobody would feed her, bathe her, change her, or keep her safe. Unfortunately, this is a reality that not only my grandma faces, but so many other families and vulnerable adults, not only fearing the safety of our loved ones, but also navigating the physical, emotional, and financial burden associated with current termination laws. This is a facility that continues to advertise as an assisted living facility, provides memory care and assisted living services, yet does not uphold the ethical standards and principle, and takes advantage of vulnerable non-English and English-speaking adults. It is not new that the older adult population is growing, and I stand here to help you hear me. Let's demand better standards for elder care facilities, and let's advocate and work together to employ legal protections to safeguard the well-being of older adults. This is your grandma, your grandpa, your mom and dad, or anyone else that means the world to you. And I am sharing my grandma's hardship to start a crucial conversation and to advocate for those that have given so much to us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we are going to Zoom. Um, we have Lisa Pep Richards. Um, as soon as she joins us there, and let's see the there's there we go. The mute is off. So welcome to our committee. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Lisa Pat Richards, and I'm from Bemidji. I was one of the four unstoppable women last summer who who, who uh, stepped up to the plate and helped Amazing. 45 vulnerable residents who were evicted suddenly from the Red Pine Estate, a low-income housing unit because of structural problems at the building. The residents were mostly elderly, low-income, and had physical or mental illnesses. This experience has been traumatizing for the residents, and I am here to urge lawmakers to support the bill before you to provide more protection for residents in these units so that this nightmare situation never happens again. With no plan in place to address an emergency, there were major health and mental issue or mental health challenges. The first weekend, one resident had to stop her stem cell treatments. Another could not go to dialysis. Another resident needed to have a pacemaker. One resident, who was a veteran, was dying with three types of cancer. Many were falling and ended up in the hospital without their medical equipment, and they went to the hospital in the ambulance. Many residents were worrying about a place to live, food, how they were going to pay for the hotel, storage units, and medicine, and uncertain how they were going to get their things out of the apartment. And then there was little help from the builder owner, the manager, the city inspector, and sadly, the county kept fighting with the city council that it wasn't their issue. 
it was theirs. Not only was there no plan for an emergency evacuation, but these residents were threatened in their lease that if they complained three times, they would be evicted. There must be a way that residents can complain and not worry about retaliation. We became on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week for these people. Us four volunteers took it upon ourselves to provide the weekend meals for these residents out of our own pockets. The community came through, we raised money through a GoFundMe, and we received grants from the United Way, Prime West, and the Northwest Minnesota Foundation. We also had Dr. Diane Pittman, owner of True North Healthcare, pay for medical equipment out of her own pocket and did medical house calls at no expense. Now, nearly eight months have passed and there's not much has changed. There's several residents who found housing but now they're gonna to have to be relocated because there's more apartment buildings in Bemidji that are having issues. Um, Red Pine Estate was the fourth or fifth apartment building to close in Bemidji in less than a year and a half. I'm not worried about the situation happening again because it's happening right now. And we are in need of 178 units ASAP. I asked for you guys to pass Senate File 4044 bill to protect our loved ones so that they can live their best lives. I also want you to know that last week I was in the Dominican Republic on vacation and I probably spent 15 hours doing this stuff. Where are we going to put these, um, these people that we don't have housing for? And uh, nothing is changing. It's just the same stuff, different day. But I do want to say one more thing before I'm done. Uh, Senator Hoffman, I would like to thank you for helping last summer when I came before one of your committee meetings with my veteran, Ron. I was able to get my DD-214 form in a week and one day. Thank you for that. And 21 days after he moved into his apartment, he passed away. So um, thank you for listening to me and let's try to do something right for these elderly people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat Richards. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Trepp. And that, that's me. That's you. That's you. Okay. Welcome to our committee. Uh, please you. identify yourself for the record and uh, continue with your testimony. Great. Hello, I'm Phoebe Trepp, Executive Director at Claire Housing. And I want to say good afternoon and thank you to Chair Hoffman and the members of this committee. Um, at Clear Housing, we provide permanent supportive housing to end homelessness for people living with HIV. Our clients are aged 18 to 80, plus their kids and partners. We provide extremely effective specialized care for people living with HIV, including nursing and end of life care. One of the services we provide is 24 seven customized living for people with disabilities. Roughly 15% of our clients receive these services. Our clients choose if they want to live here with Claire, if they want services, and if they want us or an outside provider to come in to do those services. They live in their own private apartment. We have on-site nursing and healthcare staff who see clients daily. We are an example of an exempt setting referenced in this bill under Exemption 10. We are not an assisted living facility or an assisted living provider. Walking into our buildings, there's no visible indication that we provide nursing or customized living services. It's simply an apartment that is home to many people who've never had a home before. Our concern with this bill is simply that it requires us to adopt the language of an assisted living service provider with a quote, subsidized assisted living contract. We're not assisted living, which is terminology that we feel should be used specifically for assisted living providers to help provide clarity to clients and their families. Assisted living is a licensing classification that differs from our care model and will jeopardize our ability to provide these services due to tax credit regulations. So we're one of the LIHTC properties. I recognize that there was a terrible problem with the HUD funded program in Bemidji this past year, which uh, sounds horrific and is still impacting all of those involved. However, unfortunately, this bill does nothing to address the issues of building maintenance and infrastructure improvements and would have no bearing on any future incidents of this kind. We welcome the protections for our clients. 
the current Home Care Bill of Rights, statutes governing home care services, and 504B housing protections for renters are all in place. Unlike assisted living providers, we are legally bound to all eviction and termination protections in our leases that we hold with each client. If this committee is interested in rewriting these protections in another statute, we have submitted proposed language that includes all of the protections without labeling us as an assisted living provider. We're troubled by the deepening complexity that this bill adds on top of existing laws and protections, which I just mentioned and I'm happy to expound on if, if there were time. Uh, this bill creates additional burden and puts our clients at risk of losing their services by labeling us assisted living. Our clients are dealing with how to manage diabetes, COPD, HIV, other complex issues amidst a meth and fentanyl crisis, a bare bones public safety sector and surging mental health concerns. It doesn't serve our clients to pull providers away from services to reconcile this bill. We fully support strong protections for residents and pride ourselves in our relationships with people who call Claire home. I'm just asking that you delay and take more time to work on the language in this bill in partnership with exempt settings and advocates for assisted living to ensure it would provide a specific benefit without taking away the ability to provide services to our clients and really just don't want exempt providers to be called assisted living service providers. Thank you so much for allowing me the time to talk with you today. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Ms. Knight. Um, like everyone else, if you would just please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kimlin Knight, and I'm a director of aging services at the Wilder Foundation, located in St. Paul, the Midway neighborhood. I've worked in healthcare for 20 years, with the last 10 years being in healthcare management, both in private and nonprofit sectors. I'm here to testify to opposition to Senate File 4044. Wilder has two customized living programs located in St. Paul public housing high rises. We provide medical administration, Activity, activities of daily, daily living, excuse me, opportunities for social interaction, as well as coordination for services for residents who are in need. Wilder has supported seniors and vulnerable adults in these buildings for over 30 years. By being allowed to continue supporting, we will help residents keep their homes, independence, and dignity intact. Our current longest standing resident, Ms. Ware, has been supported by the program for the last 16 years. When I meet with Mrs. Ware, she shares how much she enjoys the special events, the opportunities to continue to be independent through services like Wilder. In exempt settings like ours, we have residents who receive assisted living-like services, and we have residents that do not. The bill would require all residents to receive assisted living services. Our residents who are independent and value their independence would bristle at the notion of being labeled vulnerable if they are required to receive assisted living services. We have limited financial resources due to the federal funding status. If we're required to comply with the comprehensive set of requirements under the assisted living licensure as provided in sections 2 to 14 of the bill, many of us will have no choice but to cease offering supportive services due to the cost of the licensure and compliance being too high. The bill also does not provide any financial resources to support meeting the compliance guidelines and requirements. Residents in our customized living program are not just able to pick up and relocate into another HUD setting due to the long waiting list. We have residents from the age of 50 all the way to their 80s. Um, if we take away these services, we have 50 year olds that will end up in nursing homes that are not assisted living fit. Although we offer the assisted living like services, we've allowed them to stay in their homes. And it's, it really gets down to being ethical and knowing when people need a higher level of care. Um, my heart goes out to what happened in uh, Bemidji. Under no circumstances should that ever have occurred. Um, ethically and morally, it's just wrong. But it is a very different circumstance than a lot of our residents are facing. 
it's simply about knowing when to direct a resident to having a higher level of care, knowing when you've reached max potential with those residents, and knowing that they need a higher level of care, and, and owning that and helping them transition to the proper placement when this no longer serves as, as it should for that resident. I care deeply about the residents. I would ask you that you vote no to Senate File 4044 due to the negative impact it would have on our older adults. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, we will uh, get to questions after we finish all of our testifiers. So next up, uh, Josh Berg. Welcome back to the committee. Um, and just, you know the drill. Please identify yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, for the record, my name is Josh Berg, and uh, I am with Accessible Space, Inc., a nonprofit based here in St. Paul, providing, providing affordable, accessible housing throughout Minnesota in 30-ish other states. Here in Minnesota, we offer supports and services in several of these settings, including integrated community supports, community residential services, and customized living services. All of our settings are HUD-subsidized, affordable housing settings. And as I've mentioned in previous committee hearings and discussions with some of you, I would love to find a home for our three exempt customized living settings under 245D. However, due to restrictions on size and capacity related to CRS settings and some of the physical setting requirements related to the ICS settings, these three homes are stuck providing customized living services with an MDH comprehensive home care license. You may recall that last year I actually came before you with the support of Senator Fateh to exempt these three settings from the 25% capacity rule just in order to keep them functioning until we identified uh, the appropriate path forward. Furthermore, I had the pleasure of being a part of the discussions prior to the passage of the assisted living licensure that ended up ensuring that these exemptions in the AL licensure included HUD subsidized settings such as ours until or if appropriate alternative licensing paths were created. This is why I'm here today. While I completely agree to the why behind the bill and the general intent, as the bill currently sits, even with the amendment, I have some concerns with the several components addressed in this language. Specifically, this relates to the sections pertaining to the pr proposed contract language. These proposed contract requirements will likely be impossible to do in conjunction with HUD contracts already in place. In fact, I had several, uh, I had conversations with leadership at MHFA this morning and uh, addressed these concerns with them as well. Furthermore, the bill language does not address how to rectify situations where service providers and landlords are completely different entities and, have, and having one single contract would not be possible, let alone make sense to have. The intent I get, the operationalization is the challenge. Additionally, some of the other areas needing to be addressed include the broad use and insertion of the term assisted living to other services is problematic on a variety of levels. Assisted living has historically been a title protected term and those of us not providing these services have scrubbed it from all documents, marketing materials, websites, etc. This would now blur the lines, though, blur those lines completely, likely causing additional confusion and misunderstanding from individuals receiving services, their families and the general public. As I said, I appreciate the intent and the goals of this bill. Do I think service terminations need more than a 10 day notice? 100%. Do I think we should include protections related to handling residents' finances and property? It's a no-brainer. Do I think that there could be a better way to do appeals, coordinated moves, and transfers and plan closures? Absolutely. And should it be clear that retaliation of any kind should, will not be tolerated without hesitation? There are several good pieces to this legislation and reflect the good intent of the individuals working on this language. I appreciate them for including me in these conversations and I look forward to continuing to work with them to find a path for this to move forward. We're just not quite there yet. Thank you for your time today and I will obviously be around to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Berg. Do we have any other that would like to testify? That's all I've got on the list. Seeing none, uh, members. Questions or comments for Senator Hoffman or any of the testifiers we heard from? Senator Abler. Well, thanks, and thanks, Senator Hoffman, for taking on this topic. I think a bunch of these changes are necessary and will streamline some people. And, um, and I am well aware that uh, Senator Hoffman has uh, taken notes and is listening to the concerns from the same concerns that would concern me from Clear Housing and the other people who, just to make it work, um, but we have to make some 
I mean, <laughs> some of these places are being just struggling with some of the burdens on them. So um, anyway, so I'm, if I can be of help, let me know. But I'm just totally confident in the author's capacity to make this work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. Senator Hoffman, want any comments at this point? Yeah, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Abler, thank you. Absolutely. I, um, to that point, you know, you had always said, you know, um, for six years, you were like, all right, let's get everybody in a room. I'm just paraphrasing, but it's really, you know, the end result, how are we going to work toward that? And with that, I know Berg, Josh Berg, has, you know, uh, sat down with Sean Burke. I mean, that was a, you know, you guys find each other. I mean, it was that... The spirit of that, you know, is driving this conversation because in the end, it's those three things, really the consumer protections that we really want to focus on, right? Freedom from retaliation, the arbitrary discharge, the arbitrary discharges and the due process and appeal rights, right? Um, and so absolutely, however we can help, because there's lots of moving pieces in this, Senator Abler, um, and, and it'd be nice to be able to when we come to markup time or whatever, we're going to have to figure out what's going to be the best plan going forward. So I'm going to need um, the collective body here to really help us get to that. Does that make sense? Mr. Chair. Senator Abler. Yeah, thanks for that. And I totally expected uh, that. That's what I presumed upon. Um, wasn't there some other stuff worked on by the Department of Health that we could roll into this package as well that are, I mean, there's some little ones where they're worried about dishwashers and I mean, in a house, like, and so it's like just making it impossible and some petty things. And Stainless so, steel sinks. And so the concern was that we were going to undo somehow their grand assisted living deal, but nobody wants to do that. We just no. need to make this functional. So given the challenges of serving people with, you know, every, everybody comes and says the rates are impossible. But to serve these individuals and keep them happily not in a big place. Anyway, let's see if we can do that too. Thank you. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Ayler. Yeah, you know, going back to, like, even in, in 1998, the Supreme Court decision called the Olmstead provision that, that occurred in Minnesota had to make some serious considerations regarding, you know, segregated housing for people with disabilities. But at that time, Claire housing um, kind of was an outlier. You know, it was multiple. There's an intersectionality of, of, of this, the who they served and what they did. And, you know, we were able to find uh, meaningful language to help not only keep them whole, but keep them supported within the community. And that, you know, here we are 10 years later, um, not to revisit 1998, unless you want to talk about the Supreme Court decision, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about that. But, you know, I, I think that's something that, that's going to keep us in the conversation, because at the end of the day, you're right, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Abler, there are some multiple bills out there that are all having some kind of, um, you know, theme to, to what, we're, what we're saying here. But I just want to highlight one thing, that, I, and I've told this to the folks that are working on these multiple bills, that at the end of the day, you know, we really want to make sure we're providing residents those three things that are just so important, right? And, and the expectation from our committee to the folks out there is that they will work together and come up with some kind of um, workable solution at the end, as to Senator Abler's point, uh, Mr. Chair. And and I just, I don't want to get another phone call at night from Susie Scheller that says, do you want to know what's going on up in Bemidji? Because it was not, it was, it was the sadness thing that you just, because then you felt like there's nothing you could do right there. Here I am and then, you know, a few hours away but thank God there's Lisa Papp Richards out there and, and other, you know, citizens that just said, look, we're going to do this. And, and how shameful, can I use that term, Mr. Chair, to hear the county and the city getting into a jurisdictional fight over this? And that just saddens me, you know, I mean, that really, because at the end of the day, it's the client or the consumer or whoever that person that's receiving services that we should just be focusing on and how we do that. And I think... All the advocates that are having this conversation, they've assured uh, me and this committee that they will work together to do it. So we're going to have to, at the end of the day, when we come to mark stuff up, let's, we're going to have this conversation again, Senator Arkey. I, at least my assumption is I think we want to move this to um, another committee. I think we want to go to Commerce, right, Mr. Um, Chair? 
Thank you, Mr. Hoffman, or Mr. Senator Hoffman. Um, I will go, any further questions from members, because we just had gotten to one, anybody else? Okay, there is no other, so yes, Senator Hoffman, your motion would be to uh, pass this and, oh. Oh, wait, yeah. oh. There's, there's discrepancy. I was just told, um, uh, Mr. Monahan, that says recommend to pass and referred to commerce uh, and consumer protection. Um, Sean Burke just said, I thought this was getting laid over. Um, advice? Mr. Monahan. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, um, the language is amending a chapter of statute that falls squarely within the jurisdiction okay. of the Commerce Committee. All right. Thank you. I, on that, thank you very much for that explanation. And it'll come back here then, correct? Yeah, yep. we can keep it. Yes. You can bring it back, Senator Hoffman. Yep. So, Senator Hoffman, your motion then would be to uh, uh, this, that this bill, pass Senate file 4044, do pass and uh, be re-referred re to the Committee on Commerce. So, so moved, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Members, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I think next, Mr. Chair, you got Senate File 4457. You might yep. as well Senator Abler well will take the, the uh, front table chair. Senator. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Welcome, uh, Senator Abler. You've got Senate File 4457 before us if you would like to introduce your bill. Yeah, thanks. It has to do with assisted living director qualifications. And um, it was actually brought to me. So I, I hope that no one is harmed by this. It sounds like there's, people are kind of happy about it. But I do have an author's amendment, Mr. Chair, just to get an order, and then I'll let my testifier talk, and then see if anybody has any concerns from the audience. So I'd like to move the A1 amendment, please. Okay. Does everybody have the A1 amendment? I'm looking for it. Kind of cleans up uh, page one. Okay. Um, members, it's A1 is an author's amendment. Uh, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. The amendment is adopted. And uh, Mr. Job, welcome to our committee. Steve Job, um, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, I am Steve Job, the Executive Director for the Board of Executives for Long-Term Care Services and Support, also called BELTS. The Board of Executives is responsible for licensing of assisted living directors and nursing home administrators. The amendment presented to you today covers section 144A.20, subsection 4, with the intent of assuring individuals serving as a director of record for an assisted living facility meets the licensing requirements as quickly as possible. No, you're fine. When the board rules were adopted in April of 2021, the infrastructure for implementing the licensure process was not developed at that time. The initial licensing of directors was based off legacy or grandfathering provisions contained in the law that specified individuals with specific levels of education and experience simply qualified for licensure. Between April 1st and August 1 of 2021, the effective date of the effective date of assisted living licensure, the board issued 2,523 licenses. Since the initial adoption of the rules, the board has approved educational training programs, developed the exam processes, and other procedures for the application and renewal of licenses. At current time, there are 2,189 assisted living directors. The board is currently in the process of reviewing and revising rules. We have been working with a rules committee that includes stakeholders to include DHS, MDH, University of Minnesota, consumers groups, educators, ombudsmen, and other interested party. The timeline, for, the timeline for licensing contained in the original laws were one of the issues and that's why it's being brought towards you today. Line 1.2 reduces the time for applying from six months to 30 days from the date of hire. The amendment to the Senate file removes language from 1.14 and 1.15 relating to the scheduling of training in lieu of meeting requirement standards. Since the training courses and exam procedures are, not, are now readily available, the board believes that it is appropriate that shorter timeline 
guidelines should be implemented to assure that individuals serving in a director's positions are licensed as quickly as possible. The amendment language sets the expectation that an individual will meet standards of licensure at the time of licensing. The second other amendment to the law is lines 2.1 and 2.14 to 15. Our technical clarifications. 2.1 simply clarifies the nursing home administrator must be licensed in the state of Minnesota. And line 2.14 to 1.15 substitutes continuing education for the term training. The licensure law for assisted living facilities require that each facility employ a director who is licensed or permitted by the board. The permitting process allows an unlicensed individual to serve as a director under conditions specified in the licensure rule. This process was developed to provide flexibility, especially to small providers, as well as provide a path for licensure by people having experience in the management of assisted living facilities or related long-term care settings. An individual requiring, requesting the permit needs to meet qualifications in the rules regarding education and experience and are required to be in a mentorship while completing their field experience. The permit is issued for one year's duration and it is expected that that individual will meet license qualifications at the end of that timeline. The change in this bill does not impact the permitting process. Thank you for your consideration of this bill and I will stand for any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Job. Members, any questions or comments for Senator Abler or our testifier? Mr. Chair. Uh, <laughs> Senator Abler, you, you can put it wherever it's gonna be safe. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, actually I have a question for the testifier. Jobs, is it? Um, so, uh, in the developing, I mean, this tightens up some of the standards. And in your meetings with the, particularly the assisted living uh, sites and those crew working there, did they have any objection to any of this tightening of that? Mr. No. Job. Um, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Abler, um, one, the, everyone was really in agreement of we need to make the process easy because we're having such a large turnover and there's um, a whole subgroup of people that we never really anticipated with the original licensure, these small bed assisted livings of 12 or less, five or less, whatever demographic you want to use to break them down. That the law wasn't really um, identified some of the issues that were in it and we're hearing some of the fallouts from the stainless steel sinks that was addressed a little bit earlier and some of the other things that went along with this law change. So by and large the groups are in, are in favor of processes that streamline, make it easier and it tightens up so that people are actually moving forward in a positive manner. Thank you. That's, Senator Abler. So actually if I just I was thinking that maybe this took away some flexibility, but it gives the board more flexibility on line one point. So it has, has satisfactorily met standards set by the board, mm -hmm. pretty right. much is what it so, says. And so, um, so whatever standards you think of to do, you can set those and to be flexible to meet the needs of these places. It gives you more flexibility as a board? Mr. That's Job. It. Mr. Chairman, Senator Eagle, that is correct, that it would allow us um, some opportunities to in deal with issues as they have developed throughout the process. We're, we're in year two and we're having to uh, adjust things to meet the needs and continue to meet the industrial needs to care for the seniors in Minnesota. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Actually, Abler. So we've got a thoughtful, flexible board on our hands here. I think we should uh, encourage more of that. So I like to build even better than before. So, <laughs> so <laughs> wait, where do you want it to go, Mr. Okay. Other Chair? Um, Senator Abler, the, the executive decision up here was for the safest keeping was to lay it over and ha let Senator Hoffman that's, have control of it. That's good. Well, I, I feel very comfortable in those able hands. We will, we will lay over Senate that. File 4457 as amended. <laughs> Members, that uh, reaches the end of our agenda. So with that, we will be adjourned for today. Thank you. Yeah.